Hey everybody, my name is Bo Sanders. I want to talk to you about why I love Mad Magazine so much and why it's going to be such a loss that it is ceasing publication. I found out about a month ago that um, they're no longer going to make the print edition. And so when I was a kid, I lived in northern Chicago and I would walk down, we lived in this trailer park, and I would walk down uh, to the corner store there and uh, convenience store and I would read Mad Magazine on the rack and most of it was probably over my head but I knew that something good was happening there uh, in high school we lived in Saskatchewan Canada and I would do the same thing across from my high school there's a convenience store and I would actually uh, as a teenager buy some issues uh, as a kid I don't think that I bought many issues that I couldn't afford them but I sure loved reading it and I knew that something deep was happening there it intrigued me it sort of excited me as a little bit scandalous sometimes but um, I even when I uh, got into ministry and I was uh, decorating my office, I got a little Alfred E. Newman um, statue there to remind me not to take things too seriously and always be a little bit suspicious of uh, the system. Med Magazine uh, started in the 50s, but it really came to prominence in the 70s. And you can understand why with uh, Watergate and Vietnam and so many other crises happening in our culture, there was a shift and people began to be a little more suspicious of authority and skeptical about some of the claims of those who watched over us. It was also a media age. And so my favorite part of the magazine were the, the caricatures or the parodies of the advertisements that you'd see in magazines. And I didn't always know what the product was, but I loved uh, the underlying uh, message. Be suspicious about what they're selling you and how they're selling it to you. And I love poking holes in that. It helped me to see what was happening in uh, advertising and media and how I was being groomed and conditioned as a consumer. It also poked holes in the integrity of government. It was sort of an uh, iconoclastic uh, destruction or assault on the hypocrisy uh, that is so prevalent now and, and why so many of us are uh, skeptical. Uh, when we watch the news, we know to watch it through a lens to say that even the news is packaged for sale to keep us coming back so they can sell that TV time to advertisers. It's interesting, actually, that uh, with Mad Magazine ceasing its publication of a month of, of these issues, because the legacy of Mad has really migrated onto TV in shows like The Simpsons or... Uh, the Daily Show, uh, Saturday Night Live, even maybe South Park. And uh, that, that caricature and that parody, uh, the satire <clears throat> of uh, examining the system and the messages that are being broadcast to us uh, through mediums has been a really valuable thing. Uh, I have enjoyed uh, in the month uh, reading and listening to sort of obituaries or got me thinking about the fact that MAD is probably the closest thing we have in our society to the role that parables played in Jesus's society. The MAD magazine is subversive. It tries to undermine or call into question the assumptions in, in, in established order. Um, it uses sarcasm to do that. It's really snarky. Uh, there's a, a huge dose of irony woven through the threads of uh, the pages. And, uh, and it's asking the reader, and in Jesus' day, the parable would have asked the listener to uh, check the assumptions that you came in with, to examine the status quo, to challenge the as-is structures, and to undermine the injustices built into the system of the society. One of the things that I've really enjoyed reading, one was The World According to Mad Magazine by Tim Kreider. I'll link to that in the show notes. And the other one is called Born Under a Mad Sign by Robert Lloyd. I just want to read you a part of it. A lot of it went right over my head, of course, but that's part of what made it attractive and valuable. Things that go over your head can make you raise your head a little higher. It prompted me to mistrust authority, to read between the lines, to take nothing at face value, to see patterns in the often shoddy construction of movie plots and TV shows. And uh, 
I'm very aware that um, that was the role of parables in Jesus's ministry. Some of you that might be surprising because the unfortunate thing is many of us have been taught to read parables poorly. So I just want to say three things right off the bat. Parables are not Aesop's fables. They're not, they're not nice little moral tales that we're supposed to get some encouragement out of. Many of us have been taught to read parables as Aesop's fables because we were taught to read them as children in Sunday school, but that is not what a parable is. A parable is also not a proverb. It's not a, a prescription for how to live or faith. It's not uh, a formula. It's not formulaic. And the third thing that a parable is not is that a parable is not an allegory. And so many times I hear people read a parable allegorically where they assign uh, different characters to each uh a character represented in the story. So in the story of the prodigal son, like oh, the, the father is the God figure, or the oldest son is the religious establishment, or the younger son is the, right, the, the prodigal son. That's what it gets called in it. And even the way we classify that as the prodigal father, you know, prodigal means uh, ridiculous or extravagant. And what's extravagant in that story is the love of the father. So the pro it should be called the prodigal father. But we do this with so many parables is that the way that we come to read them and even how we know them is deeply troubling. We either read them as proverbs, prescriptive living, or as Aesop's fables, moral tales. Uh, to encourage us, or as allegories, but they're none of those things. Parables are um, lessons in disguise. They're little stories that ask you to question the big picture. So they come in underneath your radar with stories about farmers or birds or widows, whatever it is, uh, or foreigners like the Good Samaritan. There's another one that gets, that's a very strange way we read that. Parables come in underneath your radar so that your defenses go down. And then it asks you to challenge or investigate, interrogate would be a good word, to interrogate your assumptions that you came in with. Who is the good guy in this story? Why does the system work this way? Oh, I, that's a twist. I didn't see that coming. But we've grown so comfortable with parables that we've really neutered them. Uh, we've really sanitized them, and they're quite toothless. But in Jesus' day, they would have been scandalous. There is a level of snark or, or skepticism uh, that is embedded in them. Uh, Jesus used hyperbole all the time. My favorite example of this is, you know, ridiculous sort of over-the-top stuff to be subversive. Uh, my favorite example of this is the parable of the, the talents. And it, Jesus's audience would have known when they heard that parable, something is fishy right off the bat with this story. You know, a talent weighed about 50 pounds. It was a denomination of money specially designed for paying property tax. They weren't just laying around. You didn't have a bunch of them, right? So the fact that the landowner is a cruel man who sows where he doesn't reap. I mean, this is a bad guy. But in our capitalist reading of the parable of the talents, the landowner is God. So right off the bat, that's a very strange allegory uh, way to read that. So this unjust landlord, this, this criminal, uh, uh, taking advantage of people, owns so much land that he has, has all these talents laying around. So then he gives out the talents to his servants, right? So the audience right away would have known, no, no one's getting trusted with 10. First of all, it takes two servants to carry a talent and no one's getting trusted with like multiple, 10 talents, five talents. So the audience would have known Jesus is using a ridiculous, absurd, hyperbolic number right off the bat, they would have known this is like Mad Magazine. This is a caricature, it's parody, right? It's a satire. And so they would have listened to that story with very different ears uh, than we do. And so I, I think that Mad Magazine is the closest thing we have um, to a parable. And I just thought I would take the opportunity on the, the demise the, of, of publication uh, of the of the print edition 
of Mad Magazine to point out why it had such value and and sort of why I'm going to miss it so much. But um, I would love to hear your thoughts. If you read Mad Magazine, if you have found something that, that performs this same function, um, if you found a, a, a mechanism or a source that, that helps you to do this same thing, I would love to hear about it.